everyone. Welcome to Occupational Therapy 236, OT with Youth. My name is Melissa Kay, and I'm your instructor. Today's lecture is on sexuality and sexual identity. Let's get started. This topic can uh, bring up a lot of feelings for people. It can feel a little bit loaded, uh, especially when we're talking about OT with youth and adolescents who may or may not be of legal age. So as we talk about this area of development and this ADL, uh, we do so with a great degree of sensitivity and compassion and empathy for ourselves and others. Our objectives today are to identify the basics of sexuality and sexual identity for the adolescent and young adult, to explain our role in preparing adolescents and young adults for puberty and exploration of sexual identity, and then to describe a, a, a treatment technique called explicit and also some other intervention approach to address issues of sexuality for youth. And finally, to identify strategies to increase OT competence and comfort when working with clients on issues of sexuality. The OTPF4 defines sexual activity as an ADL, and they say that sexual activity is engaging in the broad possibilities for sexual expression and experiences with self or others. For example, hugging, kissing, foreplay, masturbation, oral sex, or intercourse. And that's from page 30. A few words about sexuality, which many of you are already aware of, but let's kind of bring everything to the surface and talk about it very explicitly. Uh, sexuality is core to all humans. We don't talk about it a lot sometimes, but um, it is core to all of us. It is about a physical connection with others or with ourselves, but also about intimacy. So the more uh, romantic or emotional components of sexuality. And uh, we also, especially uh, teens and young adults, are exploring, exploring our gender, others' gender, uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, etc. Uh, it's also about relationships, right? So we've had uh, our teens and young adults have had friendships, they've had familial relationships, but these relationships that have romance and sex involved may be pretty new and, of course, pretty intense. And so they uh, they bring up a lot of feelings and a lot of thoughts. And for those uh, youth and teens who are disabled, potentially also a lot of stress or anxiety and a lot of questions. Sexuality is also a form of self-expression, so we want to consider that aspect as we enter to the discussion as well. When we think about basic issues of sexuality for youth, we think about things like puberty, which includes, um, if you'll recall, both uh, primary and secondary changes. Some of the primary are actually the reproductive organs, and then secondary changes include um, uh, change in physical size and body shape, change in, in sexual function, um, hormonal changes, hair growth, things like that. There's also uh, an issue of reproductive health, right? So in this day and age, um, sexually transmitted diseases are definitely of issue to anybody who's sexually active, as well as um, issues around choosing or not choosing to become pregnant. There's, of course, sec uh, social expectations as well. Um, when is it okay to date? Who is it okay to date? When do you start dating? What is appropriate dating behavior? Um, what are the expectations from peers versus adults around dating? And who to share that information with and also who to get information from. There's also issues of gender identity and um, the whole gamut of, um, of identifying oneself either as a cisgender, in other words, a female or male, or um, 
within the wider kind of spectrum of gender identity. So that comes up for our teens and young adults as well. And finally, issues of self-esteem around sexuality and dating and romance and issues of safety. And the issues of safety we'll go into later, but suffice to say for now that our teens who have disabilities are even at a higher risk of um, of uh, being preyed upon or um, being taken advantage of with regard to uh, sexual behavior. Then there's issues that are specific to sex and uh, especially for our youth who have disabilities. And we're going to d- dive into this a lot more, but I want to start uh, start you thinking about it. So <clears throat> Uh, desirability, of course, is an issue for all youth, pretty much for all of us, right, uh, to some extent. But um, it, the the idea of am I attractive, am I physically attractive, am I romantically attractive to others definitely comes to the fore with our youth. And then adding disability is like another layer on top of that. Um, function may be an issue. Uh, depending on the disability, um, and certainly most of us think about, uh, er, you know, um, a paraplegic or quadriplegic person, and whether or not they are able to sustain an erection or um, lubrication in the case of a female, and also erection of the clitoris. Um, so we think about that piece, but overall function of the physical body also comes into play. Another aspect is assistance. So uh, hopefully in your reading, you found that, um, you know, assistance uh, for someone who has limited movement, for example, going back to our folks who have paraplegia or quadriplegia, uh, assistance with ADLs, um, with toileting, with dressing, with grooming, et cetera, are kind of par for the course. But when we when we tip over into areas of sexuality, it can have a whole other level of comfort or connotation. There's also the aspect, especially again with youth, about comfort with the topic of talking about sex. And there's finally, again, this issue of safety and physical comfort Um, with regard to the actual sexual, like range of sexual acts. I've linked a couple uh, great articles for you in the presenter notes and throughout there is a whole bunch of information in the presenter notes. So what you'll need to do is download the presentation from uh, your course shell and then you will have access to all the presenter notes. So please do check that out. There's a wealth of information there as well as a whole bunch of links to other good sources for any of the topics that you might be interested in digging into further. Then I think it's important to bring up therapist comfort as well, right? So it's our our comfort with talking about sex. And for you, it may be even more of issue because if you're treating um, teens or young adults, and I'm not making an assumption about all my students' age, but most of you are in that age range of young adult, right? So, uh, So talking about sex with peers is particularly difficult and talking about sex in general can be kind of hard. So we want to think about that. We want to work, um, think about um, working on client issues of sexuality, how we do that, what our approach is, how we remain comfortable and our clients remain comfortable. Uh, we also want to think about getting our, our, our support needs met for ourselves as therapists. And finally, and we'll talk about this a bunch, you know, there are certain uh, occupational therapists that have been uh, extensively trained in working on sexuality with clients. Most of us haven't. And so referral is appropriate and it is a part of working with our clients on issues around sexuality and sexual identity. So always keep that in mind. Then I think it's important to bring up the um, particular issues that may be confronting um, our youth who have disability and are also lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer. And we could add the IA on there if you'd like. Um, 
So we want to think about a number of factors, sexual orientation. And again, um, this is spelled out in detail in your presenter notes. So I'll do the high level. If you have questions, of course, we can talk about it in class. And you also have a resource right in this slide deck. So sexual orientation, most of us think about um, being straight or heterosexual, being gay or lesbian, which is uh, same sex attracted and um, choosing partners of the of the same gender or bisexual um, uh, being attracted to members of both genders. That is within kind of a three gender system. Now there's also an expansion to that of people who consider themselves queer, pansexual, um, let's see, uh, same sex attracted, um, gender loving, some, those are some of the terms. Then we have gender identity, which, as I said uh, a few minutes ago, is about how one feels internally about their gender. And again, this may be uh, on a female or male um, uh, scale, or it may be much more fluid. So a person may not feel particularly like a, a male or a female. They're somewhere on the continuum in between. Um, what we're seeing is that there are um, different pronouns that are coming up to describe and, and help talk about folks who, who feel um, gender fluid or in between on the gender identity scale. And uh, it's coming more to the fore. So that's another thing to consider. Also, biological sex, which is what sexual organs were you born with at birth, and also internally, um, what equipment do you have? Biological sex um, may or may not be important to a person, so consider that as well. And then there's the expression of gender. So regardless of which biological sex you fall into, how you express your gender may be somewhat different or entirely different or it may be absolutely in line with, um, with one's physical sexual characteristics. Issues affecting LGBTQ youth. And I bring this up because we, um, we want to be really aware that, um, that our LGBTQ youth are facing an added load of stressors and distressors on top of what it just means to be a youth, be sexual, and have a disability. So um, youth are, uh, LGBTQ youth are two to three more times likely to attempt suicide. There's an increased risk for STD, sexually transmitted diseases, especially in gay men and trans people. There's higher rates of smoking, drinking, and other drug use. They are less likely to get preventative care. In other words, going to the doctor before there's a problem. Um, and a lot of that has to do with stigma. There's higher rates of behavioral health issues and there's increased risks of victimization and uh, sexual and physical violence. When we're thinking about working with LGBTQ youth and clients, we want to maintain respectful communication at all times. Uh, we want to ask about pronoun and preferred name use. So rather than assuming, um, ask. And uh, chances are your client will just tell you what they would like to be called and how they would like to be referred to in terms of gender, which could be he, she, or they, or um, a number of other gender pronouns that I, as I said, have come up in, the, in our language and in our literature. Uh, it's important for OTs to educate ourselves about diversity, right? So we are discovering um, along issues of race, of ethnicity, and with respect to sexuality that um, it is not up to the person who falls into a minority category to do all of the heavy lifting and all of the work for us. So we want to be sure that we're doing our own work around educating ourselves about diversity and about LGBTQ sexuality. We, of course, want to remain non-judgmental 
and practice increasing our own comfort with working with LGBTQ youth, if we're not already comfortable, um, so that it kind of feeds back and forth, right? If I'm more comfortable, then my client's more comfortable, which makes me more comfortable, which makes them more comfortable. Finally, we want to be an advocate for accountability. And and what I mean by that is that uh, we want to help our community of OTs to be accountable to using these strategies and uh, working with LGBTQ youth in ways that are appropriate and effective and supportive. So stepping away from the LGBTQ um, area for a minute, um, sexual exploration and sexual identity are um, important for us to think about as OTs. And here's some, some tips, basically. So creating a safe space. For example, we would not want to discuss issues of sexuality in a common gym, right, or a common treatment room. We would want to have some privacy and um, perhaps uh, choose who was there and who was not there and in collaboration with our client. We want to attend to nonverbal communication, both our own and our clients. So for example, if I am uncomfortable talking about sex with, um, with my teen or young adult client, I might cross my, I can't tell if you can see that. I might cross my arms in front of my chest. I might have a decrease in eye contact. I might fidget. I might, um, turn away. I'm things like that. Right. Um, and If I'm welcoming, I might have a really open posture. I might um, have eye contact. I would smile at them, right? I would be encouraging in some way. And we want to attend to the nonverbal cues of our clients as well, because that can tell us a lot about how they're feeling, irregardless of what is coming out of their mouth verbally. Uh, It's important to be educated on resources, topics, and referrals pretty self-explanatory. And there's a lot out there about um, topics related to sexuality and disability and also sexuality, disability, and youth. And we want to um, be active listeners and refrain from making assumptions. So it can be um, tempting to talk a lot and not listen a lot, especially if this is a, an area where you're newer or you're not feeling totally comfortable. But practicing active listening is very, very important. Also, we don't want to assume anything about our client, how comfortable they are, um, what they're interested in around education about sexuality, um, what they know and what they don't know, who their partners might be, if they have any partners. We don't want to assume anything. So that leaves us with asking questions in a safe and respectful manner. We also uh, want to be aware of transference or advances from our clients. So as OTs, you know, um, we build rapport, we build trust, we do this very consciously, and we enter into a collaborative relationship with another human being, and our clients tend to really um, care for us as we care for them, right? Not always, of course but our clients care for us. And when we're talking about issues of sexuality, that can turn into transference, which basically means that um, their feelings uh, uh, of, um, you know, having a crush or romantic or sexual feelings um, in general turn to the OT rather than to folks that are are appropriate for our clients, um, you know, of a specific age. Um, it's not, uh, it's not cool to date your OT, right? So we want to be careful about that and, and gently, um, redirect our clients if that becomes of issue. And also, you know, be prepared that clients may make sexual advances to us or romantic advances towards us. And again, you know, um, we want to be compassionate and empathetic and professionally hold our boundaries and turn clients, um, you know, and just set those boundaries and make them really explicit. So um, that leads us to our last point, which is holding very clear boundaries about what we can do, what we can't do, where we'll go with discussion and where we won't, etc. 
So how do we even introduce the topic of sex, right? So it's like, okay, we're going to do a manual muscle test and then we'll talk about sex. No, no. So uh, the first thing we want to do is maintain a supportive demeanor. So we are there for them, right? We're engaged with them. We're there for them. We are a client-centered profession and we are in collaboration with our clients, We want to acknowledge potential discomfort, much like I did right at the beginning of our presentation where I said, hey, you might not feel comfortable about it. I might not feel comfortable about it, but we're going to go ahead anyway. And and bringing it out of the closet and being upfront about it can go a long way to increasing everyone's comfort. We can use a questionnaire as an entry point. So rather than simply starting with, let's talk about um, sexuality or let's talk about any concerns about sex that you have, what we can do is we can give the client something printed, of course, if they're capable and and able to um, complete that. And it's an, you know, it's an entry, right? Where they can get used to, okay, what what is this going to look like? What's the parameters around the conversation? They can express their concerns without having to say it aloud. So it's a nice place to start. (coughs) Whoops, excuse me. Take a little drink here. We also want to assure our clients that their confidentiality will be protected unless, of course, it enters into a realm where we are mandated uh, reporters, which would be something along the lines of any kind of um, sexual assault or danger that our clients are in, right? And finally, we want to provide examples of intervention strategies. So rather than leaving it up to a person's imagination to figure out what is it that OT is gonna do to help me, we can give examples. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there are two case examples in the presenter notes. These are from um, Hot Jar 2017, and they're um, practice role plays that you can read about to uh, to get some ideas about how this process works. <clears throat> 